Welcome once again to the People of the Free Gift podcast, where we ground believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach out to those caught in religion. We're glad you joined us. A few moments uh, to discuss the historicity for the New Testament. And before I do that, I want to encourage you to go to my website uh, at bellatorchristi.com. I wrote it on this board until I realized that uh, it shows ba- itself backwards on the screen. So it's uh, B-E-L-L-A-T-O-R, uh, then Christ, C-H-R-I-S-T-I.com. And so we do encourage you to go and check that out. Uh, the two sessions we have uh, on the first lecture, uh, what I would like to do is um, to look at one of these questions uh, that I'm going to present today, and then on the uh, the next session at uh, 3.30, we'll look at the last two questions. Uh, but uh, to understand my uh, desire, my, my the uh, importance that this topic holds to me, and then the historicity of the New Testament, you have to understand a little bit about my testimony. Uh, I was saved at a very early age. I was saved at the age of seven. And um, I was actually called into the gospel ministry at the age of 15. I was ordained and uh, pastored my first church at 20. And uh, towards the end of the late 90s, uh, I began to have a lot of questions pertaining to the historicity of the New Testament. And a lot of that came by the work of uh, a group popularly known in the late 90s known as the Jesus Seminar. Uh, This is headed up by guys like Robert Funk. Uh, John Dominic Croson, Marcus Borg, uh, Roy W. Hoover, among many others. They wrote a book entitled The Five Gospels, What Did Jesus Really Say? The Search for the Authentic Words of Jesus. And in their book, they, uh, well, the committee came together and they voted on the um, statements, each statement that Jesus presented. And the ones they thought were 100% those of Jesus, <laughs> they gave a red beat. Uh, for those that were 75% Jesus's, 25% the evangelists, they gave a pink bead. Uh, For those that were uh, about 25%, they believed to be Jesus's, they gave a gray bead. And for those that weren't uh, Jesus's at all, they gave a black bead. And this book, The Five Gospels, includes the Gospel of Thomas, the so-called Gospel of Thomas, and actually gives a higher ranking to this Gnostic Gospel from the second century, than it did to the canonical gospels. And I asked, uh, I asked many individuals, Christian leaders uh, at the time, uh, asking them, how do I know that the Bible is true? And I was told, well, because it's the Bible. And uh, how do I know it's true? Well, because it's the word of God. Well, how do I know the Bible's the word of God? Well, because it says so. And I'm thinking, that really didn't help. <laughs> that really didn't help at all. So, uh, I actually left the ministry for about seven years. Uh, I became uh, a a theist, leaning agnostic there for a few years. But it was in July of 2005 that I came across a Lifeway Christian bookstore uh, here in the Carolinas in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And I just three books outside the Bible that have been life-changing. Two books by Josh McDowell and one by Lee Strobel, The Case for Christ. They didn't answer all the questions I had. Uh, but it set me on a journey to to uh, search the historicity of the New Testament. And what I found, and, and like Marcia said, ago, I'm not going to be able to cover all that there is on this issue, but I just simply want to whet your appetite uh, as it pertains to the historicity of the New Testament. Uh, John Warwick Montgomery uh, provides what's called the fundamental principles of the law of evidence. And he uh, gives several different rules, like the ancient documents rule. Uh, that's customary to assume that a document is truthful unless the author disqualifies himself. Okay, then you have other th- such things as like the parole evidence rule. Uh, and this is to say that uh, uh, this rule insists that the scripture must be allowed to interpret itself and not be twisted to external extra biblical data. Uh, the hearsay rule uh, that we look uh, applied to the New Testament, uh, this demands for primary source evidence. And then the cross-examination principle that we uh, cross-examine the eyewitnesses uh, to see what type of story we get. Well, of these principles, and we could cover many other things, but what I would like to do in this session and then the next one coming up at 3.30 is to discuss three different questions that we can ask 
pertaining to the historicity of the New Testament. And the first question I would like to handle in this lecture, and then the second two I'll handle at the one at 3.30. Uh, and three questions are, are the documents early enough to contain historical information? Do they contain information that could be considered eyewitness testimony uh, or the testimony of those who knew the eyewitnesses? Uh, the second question we could ask, uh, do we have accurate translations of the autographs? Now here, we don't want to get into the debate about which translation we have in English is best. What we want to do is to see, uh, do we know, can we know what were in the originals? Uh, that's what we want to discuss. And the third question, do we have reliable eyewitness testimony in the documents that we possess uh, in the New Testament? So we have to treat the New Testament for what it is, historical documents, and then ask these big questions to see whether or not the New Testament stands. So let's take a quick look at the first question. Are the documents early enough to contain historical information? And scholars are actually, many scholars are coming to the conclusion that the New Testament is much earlier than what uh, previously was anticipated. Uh, back in the 1800s, many liberal uh, theologians and scholars believed the New Testament even dated to the second century. Uh, that is until they discovered the John Ryland's papyrus fragment, which is a, a copy of the Gospel of John, a fragment of the Gospel of John that dated to 115, 115 AD. And so nearly all scholars today are nearly unanimous in agreeing that all of the New Testament dates to within the first century, the last one being the book of Revelation, dating to probably around 95 AD. Uh, but there are reasons for believing that even the, the first three Gospels are earlier than we even imagined. Uh, for instance, Luke wrote uh, a two-part series, the Gospel of Luke and a sequel known as the book of Acts. Now, this is interesting. In the final verse of the book of Acts, Luke writes that Paul stayed two whole years in his own rented house, and he welcomed all who visited him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Now, that is a big clue that we have in the book of Acts. You see, scholars believe that Paul and Peter both died uh, by being executed, Paul being beheaded, uh, Peter was crucified most likely upside down in and around the year 65 to 67 AD. Now, Paul was under house arrest, it's generally believed, around the year 64. Now, Luke, understand, he, he records the death of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. He also records the death of James, the brother of John. Now, it seems odd that Luke, spending the book of Acts on the lives of Peter and Paul would not record their deaths unless it was that they were still alive by the time they finished the book of Acts. So my conclusion is, and many others are coming to this conclusion, that the book of Acts was written at least by 64 AD, pushing an earlier date for the first, uh, the prequel being the Gospel of Luke, which if Luke borrowed the material from Matthew and Mark, that would push Matthew and Mark being into the 50s if not even into the early 50s for those two Gospels. So we have good reasons for believing that Matthew, Mark, and Luke were all written before 64 AD. Now, some people hold to a late, later view. Even if, even if they hold a post-70 AD date, is still within the realm of, of time that eyewitnesses would have been around. But, but here again, uh, the only, it seems like the only argument that's offered for a post-70 AD date uh, is due to Jesus' teachings on the destruction of the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem. But if you add the possibility that Jesus may have provided uh, a prophetic statement, then outside of that, there's no reason, I don't believe, to hold a post-70 date. Now, some people will disagree with me, but even if you do hold a post-70 AD date, it's still within the realm of time of having eyewitness testimony. But again, I believe that there's, there are good reasons for holding uh, to, to the fact that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all wrote uh, to within, before 64 AD. Even more liberal scholars are accepting an earlier date. In fact, even dating 
uh, prior to the dates that I've given. Uh, Norman Geisler reports that William F. Albright uh, dates, or he says the following, we can already say emphatically that there is no longer any solid basis for dating any book of the New Testament after about 80 AD, two full generations before the date between 130 and 150 given by more radical New Testament critics of that time. John A.T. Robinson, known for his role in launching the Death of God movement, wrote a revolutionary book entitled Redating the New Testament, which he posited revised dates for the New Testament books that placed them earlier than the most conservative scholars even held. Uh, Robinson places Matthew at 40 to after 60, Matt Mark uh, to around 45 to 60, Luke at before 57 to after 60, and John uh, at from before 40 to after 65. So he gives them an even earlier dating than what even conservative scholars would posit. Uh, if you have a copy of the, my notes here on page four, I give a timeline uh, for the New Testament texts. Uh, and we can posit, I believe, a reasonable timeline that posits James and Galatians having been written in 48 to 49, then going to First and Second Thessalonians, Mark, Matthew, the two Corinthian letters in the mid-50s, all the way down to uh, the Gospel of John, the letters of John in Revelation uh, being to the uh, mid, mid-80s to even the mid-90s for the book of Revelation. Now, some people will ask, now, wait a minute, Brian. Uh, didn't everyone die in their 40s at this time period? Wasn't the average lifespan around 40, 45? Well, Craig Blomberg actually does a great job in his book, The Historicity of the New Testament, when he, uh, or the historical reliability of the New Testament, that is, when he says that we have to understand that averages aren't the maximum limit. Averages are simply averages. Uh, in, in fact, he gives evidence that suggests that individuals in the ancient world, uh, that records from uh, the ancient world, that is, describe a considerable number of people living into their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and even occasionally to beyond 100. So if John did write around, let's say, the year 85, he wrote his gospel around 85, um, if John had been 20 during the lifetime of Jesus, then he would have been a mere 72 years old, years young, really, uh, when he wrote his gospel. Now, I'll be turning 40 this year, and I, I can already tell that I can remember things that happened when I was a kid, just like they were yesterday. So if, if John is writing about the life of Christ, and he's re recording and recalling these fantastic events that took place in, in, the, in the Lord's life, then obviously he's going to be able to recollect those things, even being in his 70s with great precision. I believe there are good reasons for holding that uh, John, the Gospel of John, was written by the apostle uh, whose name it bears. And uh, here's some ways you connect, can connect with us through the website, peoplethefreegift.com. Uh, we have our archived messages on that same site. We have a Facebook page. We invite you to come and join the community there. And also, you can help um, the church where I'm a pastor at um, by donating. You can go to their Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash ebc.roundup. And you can click that Shop Now button, and it'll take you straight to PayPal, and you can donate whatever you want. You can set it up as a one-time or a recurring gift. And anything that you um, are able to and the Lord leads you to, um, we would appreciate it. It helps us out a great deal. If you haven't yet, go ahead and click that subscribe button and give us a thumbs up on this video. It really helps to support this channel financially and get it in front of other people. If you know of other people who like this kind of content, we do Bible teaching, we do apologetics, we do stuff reaching out to cults and those caught in religion and Star Wars and philosophy. If you know of other people who would like this, please share this video. Or share the uh, share a playlist, share our channel on um, your social media uh, vehicle of preference, and you can click on one of those social media buttons down below the video, and that would help us out.